Okay. I think I think we're ready. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. Welcome to an open forum about the post QT grant project. Um, you know myself, Natalie Myers, and Rick Junklin. Our other PIs for this project include um, John Wang and Sandra Gassi from the Center for Research Computing. PresQT um, began as an implementation grant funded by IMLS to address needs for preserving data and software with a goal of collaboratively designing um, interoperable repository agnostic data and software preservation quality tools um, that could be adopted not just by the participants in the grant, but by any library or um, memory uh, institution. Um, what the project was born out of was an understanding that there was a gap um, to data sharing, that even though um, pressures from the outside, like the White House OSTP public access memo, were beginning to require data sharing of public from publicly funded researchers starting back in 2013, that um, typically data curation was happening retroactively. And as a result, data was either not being captured at all or that the metadata for that data was incomplete because curation had happened too late in the life cycle. Um, the Digital ND Committee here at Notre Dame back in 2011 um, understood a similar problem, that we needed better tools to record the whole life cycle and to help scientists manage their data through the whole life cycle. Here on the screen, um, you see a simplified example of what you might think of as the typical life cycle for um, research projects. Um, beginning with the notion of a project, selection and development of tools to accomplish that project, data assembly and creation, then reports to funders um, and uh, preservation of that data that are accessible to funders and readers of papers. And then a time when funding ends and researchers begin new projects, what's missing in this life cycle is that a curation takes place too late. So PresQT was looking at what would happen if up there at the beginning when researchers were beginning to select and develop tools, we could better assure the quality of data, um, not just uh, at the beginning, but all along the life cycle. So that curation was more complete. One of the problems with making data and software accessible for government funded and privately funded research projects is that labs and research projects exist more like islands and um, more like silos than they do in a connected ecosystem. Um, Part of that is because of the serial nature in which funded projects are awarded and performed. Another part of that um, is because one lab might adopt a tool sooner or later than another one, so that the kind of ecosystem that's created looks more like an archipelago than it does like a coordinated United Nations kind of thing. Um, hence, we came to the notion of PresQT. What would it look like if we could query our community about where those gaps were between the islands? So we were awarded from the Institute for Museum and Library Studies a planning grant to conduct two workshops and a survey to gauge the response of researchers creators of publisher and information systems for data and software curation, and to query the developers of those systems in libraries and in industry together to find out a little bit more through those workshops and the dialogue face-to-face, -face, but also through the survey about what researchers really need. All this information that you see um, that we have been collecting through the planning phase of the project is available at pressqt.crc.nd.edu. And all of the outputs of the PressQT project are shared on the project's OSF site on the Open Science Framework. So 
if you go to the osf.io slash d3jx7 URL that's available from the PressQT homepage at the bottom right, or if you want to go straight through it, you can see the output of the workshops. The first one held here at Notre Dame in May 2017, where we gathered stakeholders from the library and research community. And then a second workshop held in September at the Research Data Alliance, where we were able to connect face-to-face um, -face with international researchers facing the same problems. Some who had United States collaborators and some who were sharing the exemplars that they had adopted in their own communities for making data and software more shareable and interoperable and reusable. Um, the thing we complemented this with was a needs assessment or survey that was administered to all the U.S. NSF PIs who had received more than $5,000 from NSF. We sent them an invitation to participate in our survey, and we also queried members from our stakeholder groups, publisher information systems, library information systems, uh, data librarians, subject librarians, and tool developers um, who had tools that were often used in research and might be tools that had output that needed to be curated by library information systems. The questionnaire for that survey, the data itself are available online in OSF, and the links to the surveys that informed our approach previous questions that we sometimes repeated and previous questions that informed what we asked our researchers are also available online. Um, the responses we got were about um, 1,700 respondents. Don Brower, who's here with us, helped us visualize these results. The survey responses are available uh, as an anonymized data set um, on our OSF website, and the data and code you see here are available in the Notre Dame Library um, GitHub site. So you can go there and interact with this visualization. If you mouse over it, it will show you more information about the responses. And um, Don made it an interactive um, and open way for researchers and um, members of the public to interact with the responses that they gave us on the survey. So it's possible for someone who answered our survey to go and look at their own data in this report. It's just anonymized for public viewing and aggregated here. Um, if you click the more detailed button um, on the question about um, whether uh, the survey respondent is interested in um, integration of tools like those below, and whether that would ease their path to publishing, sharing, curating, or reusing data or software, um, we can see even more information about the kind of tools they identified to us that fill those gaps we saw in the future of the islands. Um, one of the other questions we asked them was whether um, their um, expectations about who had the infrastructure to provide long-term public access um, to their research data. And this response contradicts what the library community had been expecting. So the Coalition for Networked Information held a roundtable about institutional repository strategies back in March um, 2017. And they published a report of that roundtable in May 2017 called Rethinking Institutional Repository Strategies. And one of the things that library experts anticipated when they got together and talked about the future of repositories was that uh, journal publishers and funding agencies um, through their um, information systems were going to take up more of the financial burden of provisioning repository solutions for mandated data sharing um, researchers didn't necessarily agree with that assumption when we asked them in our survey. They identified third-party repositories 
um, like Big Share and OSF, an institutional repository, but their own organization that's still very important to them. This article on the screen may show us a little bit why. These are the kind of experiences that researchers are having. So um, last year, this, I think it was last year, this article was published uh, from um, badges for sharing data and code at biostatistics. It was an observational study. And one of the things that came out of this paper was an awareness that um, even though they were researching badges that had been given out for papers that had data or code shared with them, these were papers that we already knew were supposed to have code and data attached to them, who had been badged or accredited for having done so. For even papers like that, at Biostatistics, 49 out of 76 of those articles that provided links to data and code had broken links when the authors of this paper went to look at them. And for statistics and medicine, 21 out of 53 of those articles, or 40% that provided links to data and code had broken links. Um, the authors surmised through their query to the publisher, which was Oxford, um, that because the publisher had switched to a new platform, that data was lost. What that illustrates to us is that the scientists may be right in their reticence to trust funders to be their preservation arm too. Maybe that's where you share data to be a complement to your published work, but maybe that's not where you want to preserve it. Maybe you need more preservation copies in a sort of locks model or lots of copies keep stuff safe model, or maybe you need an organizational or funder or third party repository solution for having preservation and active data copies alongside what your publishers might be providing. So this paper illustrated to us one possible reason why scientists were not as ready to trust publishers as perhaps libraries were. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Rick now. He's going to talk to you a little bit more about the direction of PresPT and why we put such an emphasis on the importance of repository and tool agnostic solutions in PresPT. The things we build are things we'll be able to use with systems we have here, like Curie ND and Open Science Framework, but there are also tools and services that other libraries like Purdue can pick up and use in their systems too. So the things we're building are purposely tool and repository agnostic solutions. I'm handing it over to Rick Johnson. Thank you, Natalie. So I can see on my screen that around these boxes, it's a nice gray, but on this screen, unfortunately, it's getting washed out. But there, I promise there is a gray box around the existing tools and data, as well as the existing preservation tools. For some reason, the gray on the provenance and workflow is coming through much better today than it did on Tuesday. So that was even washed out on Tuesday. But essentially, what we have here is a view of the landscape where within PressQT, we went into initially the planning grant assuming that we would build upon work that was already existing. So, so really not looking to say, we're going to create some new tools that then everyone is gonna start using and drop what they're doing. The goal here was really to look at what the tools that people were already using, the ones that they aren't necessarily using, but maybe could benefit from and how to potentially connect those together. So that's really how the, the idea of PressQT formed after all of the surveys and the workshops. The workshops were, actually heavily involved with a lot of the implementers of a lot of these tools. And the surveys really reached out to a lot of the researchers and then uh, implementers as well. But what really emerged, what were the priority areas that we were going to focus on to try to provide access? So, so that the groups that maybe had access to some of these tools but didn't have access to a, something to generate fixity in terms of checksums verifying that files haven't changed as they've been transmitted or as, as they've been saved and stored for a longer period of time. Things like provenance, workflow, et cetera. 
so so the one of the things you'll see in the diagram is that there, there's a, the difference in the the gray versus the red is intentional with the provenance workflow etc those are ones that really do not look to try to fill in any gaps that already exist we're just primarily looking to connect to existing services and the other ones are ones where maybe there is a tool but it isn't keyword assignment is not accessible in a particular tool. We want to look to build that in, et cetera, et cetera. So what, uh, what else we have here is, is in thinking about this, we also wanted to have the bar be pretty low for adoption where one, you can take a tool and then have the access to these various things, but also have it be something that is openly accessible for anyone to adopt in the future. But of course, to make the scope achievable as we're ent entering into an implementation phase for this now is really focusing on a few of those, these tools to make sure we deliver something, but at the same time, creating a framework that then others can add on support for new services, et cetera. Okay, so, so I hinted at this a little bit, but, and, and Natalie's already talked about how we've been in the planning grant phase and now we have the benefit of heading into an implementation phase, both funded by IMLS and the two grants are actually currently overlapping where the planning grant technically ends in December and the implementation grant began in July. So we've actually been working on both and those ends. And as Miranda can attest to, she has been helping us kind of from meeting to meeting manage, okay, what's the focus of this meeting? Is it on the, the planning grant deliverables or is it on the implementation grant deliverables? And we, we primarily for the planning grant, the main thing left to do is just to finalize the technical report which is a giant design document that's feeding the implementation grant, but also kind of the final report and also making sure we, we spend down all of the money uh, that we have left there. Would, but we, we did a pretty good job of maximizing the funds that we had. So now with the implementation grant, we're heading into this phase where we have this kickoff event planned for uh, Monday and Tuesday here at Notre Dame, where we're going to have quite a few different partners coming. Many of the implementers of various tools involved there or community representatives, et cetera, are going to be present. The ones that we've really targeted and, and, and sought as partners on the grant from, from the beginning are, will, will be coming to the event. So some of the, the names list here. So we have a, a series of funded subordies. So these are institutions that are actually getting money from the grant and also providing in-kind contributions as well. That was something that is a requirement of IMLS is it is a 50-50 a, a cost share at, at minimum of, of what is for implementation. So Johns Hopkins, National Data Service, UC San Diego, Hub Zero, and Yale are the primary ones there. Johns Hopkins, we're really looking to leverage their experience with Fedora development for Fedora repository. National Data Service has done a lot of things with compute infrastructure and integrating with that, with dashboards for execution, things like that. UC San Diego is going to be contributing with their experience with SHARE and also we have the benefit of learning from their experience with Chronopolis and uh, the San, San Diego Supercomputing Super Center. And then of course HubZero and with all the experience with that, that, that's actually a platform that's a little bit similar to the Open Science Framework if you're familiar with it, but it is a, kind of an active research platform. And then Yale uh, with their easy grant, their emulation as a service environment, they're going to be plugging in from that standpoint where if there is software that is needed for some of these things that can, we can plug that network in to hopefully aid that part. But, but really in addition to just the partners that will be implementing tools, et cetera, there's also a series of testing partners that we have. So a lot of, quite a few smaller libraries, undergraduate libraries that, that adds kind of an interesting flavor to the effort where folks like Amherst and Bonbon and Tuskegee, they will look at that, okay, as an institution that doesn't necessarily have like a full team of developers or a big IT staff, a big center for research computing, how could we benefit from this as well? And then in addition to that, even though they're not among the members of the ones that are receiving money, there's also others that have just signed on to do in-kind contributions like ReproZipper, ReproServer, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, CERN, and uh, some of the research data alliance groups that, that Natalie mentioned earlier as well. And then, and then there's also the, these big communities like the Midwest Big Data Hub, Science Gateways, 
data creation network, software preservation network, that was actually pretty vital that we had those communities involved in this because again, we're not looking to present an alternative to what others have been doing. We're looking to integrate and incorporate with, with what others are doing. Okay, so you, I, I, bet, I, I am betting that you won't be able to read all the text on there, but one of the things I, we wanted to show this was to show kind of the series of contributions over time that we have expected of various folks. So there's at the various top, at the top you'll see technical leadership and advisors, anticipated code documentation, testing, and then collaboration. Now diving a little bit closer, these are the, this is the core team. So you'll, you'll see the names that Natalie mentioned earlier in terms of the PIs, but also Miranda and Don Brower. And then we have other developers that are not showing up in this list right away, but the, one of the primary development partners in this will be the Center for Research Computing. So this really is a grant that is a, a collaboration between the CRC and Hesperg Libraries as the primary awardees. And then we have Jess Bees as well, and, and he is someone that was with the Center for Open Science, but then broke off as an independent consultant. So we're pretty lucky to have the benefit of his experience past there, but also more of his time than we would have had with him as the, as the CTO there. Okay, so then looking at some of the names, you, you'll, folks that I've worked with, uh, these various People you'll recognize the names of Elliot Metzger at Johns Hopkins and Christine Kirkpatrick and Craig Willis, David Miner, Michael Zentner, Ewan Cochran, and Seth Anderson. So these are all people that were that are that are uh, anticipated to come to the event on Monday and Tuesday. And then looking again at the other partners, there are also folks on this list that will be attending as well. I don't remember if it's everyone on this list. I, I don't think it's necessarily everyone, but I think a, a, a good a good portion will be. It's, Sunye is one that I think will be presenting remotely. Is that, is that correct? Yes, yeah, Sunye from CERN will present on um, Monday in the first uh, set of lightning talks. We're her collaborator. And um, we'll have a series of lightning talks both days on the Friends QT website. You can see the agenda for the Monday and Tuesday kickoff meeting. And feel free to step in if you'd like to hear any of the lightning talk for the uh, discussion session. And one of the things to mention about the benefit of having CERN involved is they have a lot of experience working with big data as well as a, a, a repository system that they developed in Vigno, which consequently is actually the, the foundation for what was created for Tind. So if somebody had seen Tind come visit, there's a lot of overlap and ties in terms of community and experience and knowledge there. Okay, then, then lastly, the different groups of other organizations and institutions that will be involved there with testing. Okay, so I wanted to say a quick little bit about the easy grant that I referenced with Yale. This is actually a little bit of a bi-directional grant relationship that we have with Yale and Notre Dame with this, where Yale is one of the subawardees for our Press QT grant. We're also a collaborator on the Easy Grant. We're not a sub E, but we are providing in-kind contributions and looking to be a node within this network they're building that is essentially meant to be a network of different servers that can bring up software and run it for you. And then you just connect to it. So if you can think in the past of the way things had worked with the Citrix servers, if you're familiar with those and libraries here, it's, it's a similar idea, but really on, on you know, updated technology but at the same time, it's looking to provide an environment to really run whatever kinds of machine environment was expected at the time something was used. So, so let's see, Windows 95 would have been 23 years ago. So, or really 23 to 20 years. And then Windows 98 came on and people kept using Windows 95 and there were all kinds of things like that. Those are the kinds of things that do come up. And with that, at the, the, the local team that has been involved with this, which is a, it's, it's a, a Venn diagram with the folks involved with PressQT, has been a survey of our existing catalog items and within it, ones that we think would have software that we aren't maybe not currently linking to, but we could add a link to to then make it more accessible, whether it be a data set or other kind of content. Those are, that's the kind of list that we're building. So that then when we go back 
to uh, the overall network that's being built, we can then potentially run software from another place that is a part of this network. But Neurodame is also signed on to be a node, uh, but not necessarily guaranteeing we'll run every kind of software that is accessible everywhere. But at the same time, that's no longer necessary. So coming back to PressQT, so looking at the overall landscape of types of services that we're looking to connect here, in the very middle on the left there, you'll see virtualization. There is a, is there a laser from here? There is, all right. So virtualization there, that's where the easy grant comes into play. But there's other things like the metadata tagging and the fixity provenance, et cetera, then connecting to other external services. So how can we make it easier to push to community repositories? Uh, go to Reprozip where you can make it easier to capture the researchers compute environment where it does things like containerizing if you're familiar with that very similar to docker and I does it utilize docker it does use so it's a wrap around docker uh, and then there's other things like preservation etc so we're really one of the questions that came up when we showed this diagram, a previous version of this diagram there was one arrow that was only unidirectional and since then I've, I updated it to be bidirectional because it was never really intended to be a question about which direction things were flowing because this is always intended to be something where we don't want it to be just flowing one direction but also being able to go the other ways as well. Okay, so looking at the overall timeline, uh, so this is getting into really the, the heavy detail of how we're looking to orchestrate the grant here. So we are in that first line, the Q3, Q4 2018, so meeting with all partners next week and having the video calls open the community, et cetera. But as you start to go down the list, uh, there's different steps of prototyping and that's building up the framework where people can actually plug in various services and connect them. So, so it's looking to have that be uh, generic enough where different services can plug in. But one of the things you'll notice there is there's different uh, meetings with the development team, screencasts, et cetera. So that development team, again, is, is, is really looking to be uh, quite a few members, I think four or five developers from the CRC, plus uh, Don Brower in the libraries here as well. And one of the questions that came up in a meeting we had on Monday where it was heavy CRC was, well, who's going to do the screencasts? Is that going to be the developers? And they, they did not want to. And they were assuming the primary investigators of the PIs, so myself or Natalie or John or Sandra would be the ones doing that. And we're totally comfortable with that, but at the same time, in order to be able to do that, we need to be able to working, be working closely with them and understand what are the kinds of things we need to emphasize, what are the things that work now, what are the things that don't work, uh, what are the various things that are coming. So all along the, the way, it's really going to have to be a pretty collaborative process within that. So then another aspect to this is in terms of the integration, this is where it, the, the plan emphasizes the, the three different systems that we have promised to integrate with. This is not necessarily an exhaustive list or, or what we kind of aspire the list to, to be in the end, but really looking to see we're going to at least integrate with Fedora and the Open Science Framework and Hub Zero as ways to be able to push to preservation and, and repository systems but also thinking about those integrations as how can we make keyword assignment easier in those kinds of active systems like the Open Science Framework where researchers are actively depositing work before they, they think they're at that preservation stage. And then thinking about the, the design goals, so really not looking for these to be standalone solutions, but really built with standard APIs and also having uh, user-centered design and collaborative development. And this is, I think Natalie had already said this was, uh, our grant is something that has been a radically open grant. And really it's, it's going to be no different with the code where we're going to have it up on GitHub from, from the get-go. And thinking about the overall design and requirements. So this is something where we're really looking to the initial kickoff meeting, which will really be an active working meeting, where it's not just going to be everyone giving presentations for a day and a half, 
but really looking to give a few presentations for a couple hours, but that's really meant to just lay the groundwork for these active design discussions where we can start to say, okay, how are we actually going to work to build these things together? What is the current support now for these various tools? Do these tools actually have an existing API, uh, et cetera? So, so really we want to get from the point of where it kind of still feels a little bit nebulous on the, on the left there to the point of that, that smooth road. So then a lot of things we'll be capturing so, so the, and, and the way we have the, the breakouts actually set up is first by tools, getting a survey of that, and then shifting to the focus on the services. So then we can bring those various things and, and, and focus on those areas. Okay, so then looking again at the closer look at the, just a different look on the implementation grant timeline. So where we are is on the left there with the Q3, Q4 design tools and services and the meeting is coming up here. And then we're, we have another meeting that I think is going to be somewhere else than Nerd Aims or the site isn't set yet. So we got one of our partner organizations doing conference presentations, et cetera. But then really looking to start doing these development sprints in January, I believe, I think is when those are slated to begin. And then you'll notice in this integration phase, that's where a lot of the, the heavy focus is going to be on the integration with the other tools and so because of that, a lot of the funds are earmarked for the partners to really start coming online at that point. But at the same time, like I, similar to how I mentioned about the PIs need to be involved to be able to create those screencasts, the partners need to be plugged in all along to understand how they are going to look to plug in and build. And if they are ready to plug in, especially if they are just in kind, there isn't necessarily a huge reason for them to wait if there is that place for them to, to, to plug in already. And then there's the link to the award there we can go back to. Okay, so then just a quick note about what's going to be happening. It's actually going to be happening here in this room, mm -hmm. as well as the other rooms. We have the 231 reserved as well as the, the, the back rooms for, for breakouts for this. So, that's, so, so if you see a lot of folks in the libraries on Monday and Tuesdays, especially Monday early afternoon, if they look at the loss, you can help kind of direct them this direction. Uh, but we're pretty excited about, about that happening. Okay, so that is that. The link to the slides is there in the OSF. So again, just like everything else, we've made these presentations open to anyone to see. So it's not just, well, this is just for Notre Dame. Uh, and then lastly, should mention that we've been recording this session so that then we can also make the recording available. And we'll probably just I, I, we'll have to figure out, how, do we put that on the OSF as well? I think we probably should, and we'll send that out to the, to the libraries. Okay, so that point, open up for any questions. Dan, yes. If I can restate my own words, see if I understand what's going on. Project partners from multiple institutions might be working with data sets, different data sets, code, whatever. They would be using, um, figure eight and press QT API tools to say upload and then press QT will sort it out to open science framework or GitHub or Fedora to preserve the data or what? Not quite. Okay. I'll, um, in a super easy world of the future, it would be great if there was a mitigation service like that that helped you decide where to upload to. But in press QT, what happens is that we create web services that connect systems to systems rather than users to systems. Uh -huh. So a user of Hub Zero, for example, could pull a file from OSF and bring across the metadata that was attached to it in OSF and augment that metadata over on Hub Zero so that it was more fully documented and it had higher quality metadata records before preservation copy of that um, project was um, shared for publication, for example. Or you might find that um, for National Data Service, we have a video of this up on the website. Um, the National Data Service Dashboard 
and allow a user on the national data service dashboard to open a program that is stored on Curie ID and executable mm -hmm. and pair it with data from the open science framework and then use that data as input to the program and run it from the job submission of a national data service um, providing connected tissue between OSF national data service and institutional repository like Curie and D. What PressQT does is it says, well, that was a cool prototype, that thing we did with national data service, OSF and Curie and D with the under the hood is Fedora. Um, what would it be like if we could extend that benefit to other libraries? Or if we could have better metadata at the end of it, or better ways of reporting on the fixity of files through that process from system to system. Can I trust that the input file over on National Data Service has the same literal fit and the same hash as the input file that I wanted to pick up from OSF? Am I confident in it? Is the, the data quality high enough that I can have confidence that this file I'm using for input is the one that I am secure will give me the results I'm expecting over on NDS. Because you don't want to fill up all that microphone computing with jobs you're not confident in running. So by improving metadata quality, fixity information, and the connected tissue between systems so they can each be more aware of one another's stored data and strength. Mm -hmm. PressQT provides benefit to all the participating organizations, even if, for example, they run a bureau instead of a Fedora back repository. It's a project agnostic for the reason that it can um, provide benefit to all participants. So I think um, different individual organizations might up different parts of that connected tissue, some but not all, and that would be okay. For example, you might just fill in the gaps that are gaps in your ecosystem. Mm -hmm. When you elect what from PressQT to implement at your home institution, mm -hmm. but you won't have had to individually, concurrently, or um, um, repetitively fund that development because there will already be work you can grab. And just like the code is being made available, so too are the grant charts, the um, budget structures, the sprint uh, planning. All those items are ones that have been made um, generic enough to be reused by other organizations in the UK and the EU to pick up and do this as well. So. Um, we're hoping that what it does is create a more interoperative ecosystem that all collaborating scientists can benefit from. And the people who are in a role where they have an obligation to help them preserve that data. And to give you a sense of kind of where we're excited about the forward progress of this, so that as Natalie mentioned, the kind of designs, et cetera, that was really always the intended to deliver both the planning grant was to pretend to present a potential design and now the implementation grant has taken it a step further to say well we're going to implement that design for at least these three services and then really we do aspire that other service providers will then take that and add support for, support for additional services after that there is of course the freedom for anyone that feels uh, ready enough to take it and try to implement something themselves but we're, we're not assuming that that is the way we'll be successful People can pick up and adopt what they need from the project, whether that's John's code for visualizing the survey results mm -hmm. to um, Miranda's uh, Gantt chart to um, any of those elements that are shared out on the OSF project. So the idea is we don't expect all organizations to be at the same levels of uh, information system maturity. Some organizations
conditions have in their very mature information system that they need to upgrade. Other organizations have new, very standard informed interoperable systems that is easier to attach to web services from. While other organizations, uh, um, smaller um, universities or at um, places where technical adoption is slower, maybe just getting started. So the idea is that by having a mix of both public and private universities participating in a mix of um, our ones and more teaching and learning focused uh, organizations that will have a combination of um, different organizations doing testing and we're going to feel for how hard it is for small organizations to adopt through their participation in testing but also with organizations like the coalition of open access repositories and um, organizations like Software Preservation Network, we can have whole groups of interested parties testing use bits of this system. Yesterday, I was contacted by New York Public Library, and they were interested in the use case they had and how it might fit into Press PT. And that's mm -hmm. terrific, and just what Press PT should provide. It's an on ramp for any library to participate at the point of need with the kind of uh, information system need that would be fulfilled by these services. So the bottom line is if institution A using a using Fedora, institution B is using open science framework and they're each contributing different parts. PressQT provides tools to make those systems communicate, operate. That's right, and not just the tools, but the examples mm -hmm. from how to implement to how to test mm -hmm. and how to test whether you're big or small and how to implement whether you have a bunch of in-house developers or no developers. Right. Um, because our cost share partners might only have their developers working on tests and not tool development. But that's perfectly okay if all they want to do is add one of these services mm -hmm. to their already mature system um, they can have developers just working on test and integration rather than on tool development mm -hmm. so it gives people a way to have an entree to the project that fits their organization's need rather than making the bar the same height for everyone mm -hmm. Um, because we all have systems at such different levels of funding and systems at such different levels of maturity. In the grand scheme of things compared to Hub Zero, our trade and D system is a newborn. Um, so it's wonderful to compare the capacity of Hub Zero with a system like Curie and think about how it's the same or different to provide these services to Hub Zero as it is to OSF, as it is to create, to know where the um, benefits, barriers, strengths, and hiccups are, um, so that we can share that with our colleagues before they embark on um, integrations mm -hmm. or um, ambitious projects. Now, with these timelines, with these and the budget you can fill in the line for your organization if you decide that you want to adopt some of these systems integrate it or um, migrate to it yeah another tool i don't think we mentioned is something called pull tail which is actually the reason why one of our co-pi sandra guessing isn't here she was presenting on this as well but in chicago today at the whole tail meeting and whole tail is, is a system that is also multi-institutional collaborations but it's looking to build that executable environment for data related to publications, kind of a plan words on long tail and whole tail, or the long tail being a lot of the research that tends to echo the original research on various topics, really looking to say, okay, those, those that echo, those are the folks that are going to get the most benefit from being able to execute and reuse data that, that has been uh, brought forward from previous research. 
a talk of others funded, I believe, by National Science Foundation and it's some kind of collaborative project um, that allows people to bring data and code into one gateway and um, run uh, code from a publication against the data from that publication where mm -hmm. researchers own data to see if they get the same result. We also have a Chris PT workshop participant from uh, last May, Code Ocean, is continuing to participate. They provide a cloud environment for shared computing and code sharing. And we also have a participant from um, Cal Poly with the uh, Jupyter Notebook project that allows people to um, run and change code live in the context of a story, basically. So it makes um, tools like Jupyter, Code Ocean, and Fultel um, have a better informed place within an ecosystem of data preservation than they might otherwise if they were only part of an ecosystem focused on or provided by publishers and publishers. Any other questions? Yes, Tara. Uh, this might be a bit ahead of the track, but beyond the grant period, which is not the wild success, what happens to the tool if, in terms of a long term sustainability, what might be our particular role beyond the grant period, you know, both in work and outreach to? Yeah, it's, That's a yeah. great question. Rick, can you flash back to the slide that has the link to the proposal at the bottom to the award? Sure. That one. At this link at the bottom of this implementation grant timeline, the link there takes you to the proposal that we gave the Institute for Museum and Library Study. And thankfully, IMLS is so well organized, they asked us Tara's question. And it's something they're very concerned about as an organization. At the end of funding, what happens to these things you built with public funds? In this case, they'll all, the code will all still be shared on GitHub for anyone to pick up and reuse or extend. And the workshop and implementation phase resources, including all that budgetary information, all of that sprint planning, that's all available to um, pick up and use for new adopters. So if your organization's not ready now during the funded period of the implementation grant, that doesn't mean that you can pick all those resources up and approach a funder with them at your organization's point of need in the future. So that's one way this grant benefits beyond the life of the grant. Another thing that we address is ways that the, can you flip back to the diagram of participants, particularly the collaborating organizations. Go forward to that one, one more. One more? Um, okay. When we look at Coalition of Open Access Repositories, CERN Open Data, Research Data Alliance, Center for Open Science, Data Curation Network, Science Gateways Community Institute, Software Preservation Network, and West Big Data Hub. These all represent organizations that are anticipated to continue beyond the life of the Press UT grant funding. So even when our funding ends and our implementation is done, these organizations and their members can still benefit from what we made, and our members will still be participating in these organizations, keeping that project and that expert network of people who were involved alive for later adopters. So the expertise will still be available organizationally because we have organizations participating in press QT, not just individuals. So if you go all the way back to sort of the full screen snapshot of this uh, picture, you'll notice that 
We have different roles for participants. We have our technical leadership and advisors. Um, many of our technical leadership and advisors also have um, leadership roles or membership roles within those participating organizations that helps keep the project momentum going for later adopters. And then our collaborating projects and organizations, um, our test partners and our membership organizations um, will maintain uh, organizational memory about Crescucci and access to support networks for people who are interested in bringing up the projects themselves because they're later adopters or because they weren't ready um, for fixity, for example, um, when uh, Crescucci was funded, but later two years down the road when they are ready for that, you can say, oh yeah, that's how they did it in Crescucci. We're gonna go back and get that part and update it for our own use and bring it forward with internal funding or go out to funders and bring them this project plan because we know it worked for Crescucci and it was not just vetted by a funder and used to run the Crescucci project, but it's um, one that had community input, not just single organization input. So we think that strengthens the reusability of all the resources in Crescucci in a way that you might not always find in a collaboratively community um, developed open source project. And we're trying to make this project not just be open source, but truly be collaboratively developed and collaboratively engaged with so that its momentum continues beyond the um, funding phase. And then in addition to that, in addition to all the, the groups that uh, Natalie mentioned, for the service that sits in the middle, we also have the commitment for that to be running in the CRC infrastructure beyond the, the life of the grant as well. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, really appreciate you coming and listening to the presentation here. And, if, and as we mentioned before, we're recording this, so we will send out the link to others. So, so there's any particular part you want to point someone to, you can say, you know, take a look at this part of the presentation, et cetera. But the, also the, we'll send out the link to the slides just in general uh, that folks will be able to take a look at. I will stop the recording here and really appreciate it.